Welcome to Through the Bible. Today we're going to explore one of the most phenomenal events in the history of mankind. In fact, it was almost the end of mankind, except for God's grace. Our scripture today is Genesis 6, starting at verse 14, and if you can, turn to that passage now. And as you do, Greg and I have got an update on wonderful things, wonderful things that are happening on the continent of Africa. Yeah, Steve, uh, missiologists talk about Francophone Africa. That's just a fancy way of saying French-speaking Africa. And a huge portion of Africa speaks French, just going back to the colonial days, particularly up in the central and northern part of Africa. And, uh, you know, all of our ministries are are important, but some of them just have seem to have a little zip and pizzazz and the and great responsiveness and our African French is one of those. Yeah, and it could be a result that you know the the zip and and growth that we've seen is because evangelicals in that part of the world 1900 they estimate there were 1.6 million. Yes. A little bit of a boom went to 182 million in 2010. Yeah, there's tremendous uh, zippiness in the in the church in, in Africa. I don't think missiologists would accept that term, but yeah. a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm and uh and and we're, we have this important role of, of grounding people, getting them excited, but also keeping them grounded in the Word of yeah, God. Yeah, anytime you get that much growth, it, particularly in a yes. third world country, you're, you're not going to have a lot of seminary trained yes. pastors. You got people that love the Lord and, you know, got saved today and tomorrow they're out preaching. Yeah. And, and through the Bible does a great job in providing that foundation for those folks. We've said it so many times on this uh, study. We've, we've said that Africa is a mile wide and an inch deep, and we're just trying to help those Christians get deeper. Yeah. Now, most people in Africa are going to speak English, and yet we're heard in over 27 languages and dialects. Why is that, Greg? Well, that's because there's actually hundreds of languages spoken on the continent. You've got tribal languages. And as we say so often, we're trying to get into people's mother tongue, their heart language. And so we're just slow slowly penetrating these lists of languages, and uh, by God's grace, we're able to reach most people on earth in their first uh, tongue. Yeah. Now, we do have 75 million people that speak African French, Mm -hmm. and so so that's clearly one of our our main programs. And I think we've got a clip uh, that we're going to play, so you can get a flavor of what it's like listening to Through the Bible in African French. À travers la Bible, une série d'enseignements tirés de la Bible, préparée par le Dr. Vernon Magui du ministère Through the Bible. Well, now that you have a little taste of African <laughs> French, wow! And our our uh, our producer and host Marcel Doe, you can be praying for him. He's got yeah. some health issues, some chronic pain stuff that he's going through, and uh, pray that the the listening family would continue to grow and that his ministry would be able to continue. And Steve, I can tell you, I've heard so much about him. Uh, he really is the African French Doctor McGee to his people. They love him, yeah. and it's obvious in the responses. Yeah, here's a, a recent text that they got. I am a young Muslim who listens to you every day. I'm very touched by through the Bible. Your teachings are the reason why I am phoning you to testify the benefits of being a child of God. The messages speak to me. I thank you. Wow. And here's an email. Notice we're getting a lot of electronic communications yep. from Africa. I teach the Sunday school children in my church. I believe that the teachings you give through your program are very profound. I, I want to stop, Steve. I've traveled all over the world, and there's two words that I hear through translators usually. Yeah. Simple and profound about yeah. through the Bible. Very interesting. This email goes on. I'm very happy, and I do not want to miss a lesson. I carefully listen to this program and share them with these children eager to listen and learn. Yep, that's just another example of the seminary aspect of Through the Bible playing itself Amen. out in Africa. Here's another one. This is an email. Pastor is how he addresses the... the uh, uh, yes, they, they, they see Marcel as their pastor. They yeah. often call him pastor. Pastor, you are not going to believe how much your messages teach me. The teaching you give is fundamental for the life of every child of God. It was through your messages that I knew Jesus who transforms my life. Before, I did not go to church. I spent my Sundays in bars with women who are not my wife. Today, thanks to your broadcasts, I am reconciled to God and the body of Christ as well as my family. Thank you very much. Those letters are so encouraging. They really are. Greg, why don't you go ahead and pray for us? Father, we marvel at the power of your word. We marvel that you've raised up servants like Marcel Da to teach your word and the way it's transforming lives. We pray it would transform our lives as we study today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. And friends, we come today to the flood. Now the entire human family had turned from God. There's none righteous, no, not one. But here was one man who walked with God. He believed God. Here's a man still trusted God. By faith, Noah. Now there is a striking contrast between the fact that the days of Noah to be duplicated before the Lord comes again to the earth. And that's for his, not rapture, but coming to the earth to establish his kingdom. But there's some remarkable parallels that have already taken place. For instance, the way this chapter opened, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters born unto them. There was this tremendous population increase, and man had spread by that time pretty much over the earth. He was in North America. He was here. He was in Asia, in Europe, and in Africa. He'd spread in every direction. And today, we have this tremendous population explosion, and men again will increase on the face of the earth. And then there is the fact that during the great tribulation period, the Holy Spirit will no longer restrain evil. Now, he'll still be there to convert man, but he'll not be restraining evil on the earth. We are told very definitely. And God's overtures to man will be despised and rejected, and certainly they are today. Isn't it amazing that the only ones that are listened to today are the liberal Protestant ministers and the Roman Catholic? You hear nothing today of conservative men. Now, they've attempted to make some sort of an inroad, but they've had several conventions, and they're trying their best to get back in the mainstream. But we've come to the day that if you're going to stand for God, you're going to find out that you will not be able to talk before a TV camera very often. You've got to learn to protest and march and deny everything before that. Now, may I say to you, of course, the world in that day will be faced with the great problem of the rapture. There'll been a great number of people that have left the earth. And may I say also, there were judgments in that day, and yet they did not heed them. That was the warning that God had given. Now, let's look at the flood itself. The first is the preparation that is made for it. God is giving ample opportunity And here in verse 14, God says to Noah, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. That's an indestructible wood, very much like our redwood here in California. Room shalt thou make in it, in the ark. And the word for rooms has the idea of nests. Now, the elephant would need a room, but may I say to you that the mole wouldn't need quite that much room. They can just give him a little dirt in the corner. And that's all that he would need. And we're told, and he shall pitch it within and without with pitch. That is, it was to be made waterproof. Now, here were the instructions. And this is the fashion which thou shall make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. The breadth of it, 50 cubits. The height of it, 30 cubits. The impression that most people have of the ark is the impression they were given by the little Sunday school card. It looked like a houseboat. And it was, to me, a very ridiculous sort of a travesty. And it was a caricature of the ark instead of picturing it like it actually was. To begin with, may I say to you that the instructions for the building of the ark reveal that it was quite a sizable sort of an ark, and thou shalt make the ark and finish it, and it shall be 300 cubits. Now, if a cubit is 18 inches, that ought to give you some conception of how long this ark was. Now, the question arises, how could they make it substantial in that day? Well, friends, you're not dealing with caveman. You're dealing with a very intelligent man. Noah was an intelligent man. You see, the intelligence that the race has today came right through that man, and he happened to be a very intelligent man. Now, he's not making an ocean-going boat to withstand 50-foot waves. All he's doing is to have just a place for life, animal life, 
and man to stay over a, quite a period of time, by the way, but not to go through a storm, actually, just to wait out the flood. That was all. And for that reason, it might lack a great deal. And it did not have to be built as an ocean-going boat. would give it a great deal more room. So 300 cubits, and if a cubit is 18 inches, that's 450 feet long. That's a pretty long boat, by the way. But the relative measurement is the thing that interests me. And you put this down by, for instance, the New Mexico, one of our battleships some time ago. But it was built 624 feet long, 106 and a fourth feet wide, and the 29 and a half, the mean draft. Well, may I say that you put down the comparisons and it's practically the same, so that you have not a ridiculous looking boat at all, but one that would compare favorably with the way they build ships today. We're told here, a window shalt thou make in the ark. Now, the window wasn't a little slit made in the side of the ark. Have you ever stopped to think about the stench that might be in there with all those animals in there over that period of time? Well, a window shall thou make in the ark, and the window went all the way around, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. Now, from a cubit, from the top of the ark, from the roof, and the roof must have overlapped that quite a bit, and underneath there was a cubit, 18 inches, that went all the way around the Art. Now, that's the way they ventilate a gymnasium today. I noticed it at the State Fair at Dallas, the building in which the animals are, have that window that goes all the way around at the top. And may I say, with all the animals they had at the State Fair in Dallas, Texas, it wasn't a bad place to be. People were sitting in there eating their meals and sleeping there. Very comfortable. And the odor was not bad. I've heard that poor Noah had to stick his head out this little window to live. Well, that's ridiculous. We're not looking at that type of a thing. That's man's imagination. It's not what the record says here at all. And friends, quit reading Sunday school cards. The pictures that were given to me when I was a kid, I've had to unlearn practically all of them. And that little ridiculous boat, I wish we could get rid of it. Now we're told, and the door of the ark, now it only had one door though, and that's important. Christ said he was the way. I'm the door to the sheepfold, by the way, and he's the door to the ark. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower second and third stories shalt thou make it. Now it was three decks here, you see, and then I take it one on top or one on the bottom maybe. That would make four decks. And was there a door for each one? I personally have not come to any conclusion here. I'm rather of the opinion there was only one and not one for each floor. But that, frankly, again, is beside the point. Now, God says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. Now, God is bringing the judgment upon the earth, upon animal and bird and man. But with thee, God says, will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, the cattle after their kind. And again, you must understand by this time, one cow would represent the entire cow family, the Holsteins and the Jerseys and the Guernseys and all the others. And then every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. Now, that is something else that we need to pay attention to. It's repeated again in the next chapter that Noah wasn't a Frank Buck who went out and bring them back alive. He wasn't a big game hunter. He didn't have to go after these animals. They came to him. We're told that. And we'll see in the next chapter they did come to him. They'll come to you. 
Now, why would they? Animals in danger will do that. I remember the first time that we went into Yosemite Valley when our daughter was just a little thing and she'd never seen snow before. And we put her down in the snow and she began to whimper, but she quit when she looked over and saw a little deer. Well, actually, I believe we could have gone over and petted that little deer, but we didn't try it because I knew something about the danger of them turning on you and being able to kick and kill an individual. So we didn't approach them any closer. But I mentioned that to the ranger. He laughed. He said, yes, there's snow up in the high Sierras right now. And when there's snow up there and there's danger, they come down here and as tame as any animal could possibly be. But the minute that the snows melt and it becomes spring, he says they spring out of this area and you couldn't get in a country mile of any of them. Why? Well, because when an animal is in danger, it'll come. Not at the time of the flood. I don't think Noah had any problem at all. I think they all came to him. Now in verse 21, Take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. And now he's to do something very practical. It took a lot of hay in the ark to feed these animals. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now, somebody's going to say, but some of those animals ate meat. They'd eat each other. I don't think so. You say, why? Well, up to the time of the flood, apparently both man and animals were not flesh-eating. They just didn't eat flesh. No carnivorous animals, I assume. We are told of a day in the millennium when the lion and the lamb will lie down together, and the lion's going to eat straw like an ox. And that could certainly come. That probably was the original state of the animal. Now, will you notice, we come to chapter 7. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come, thou and all thy house, into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Why was he righteous? By faith. Just like Abraham later on was. We're told Abraham believed God and has counted to him for righteousness. Noah believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And by faith, the writer to the Hebrews said, that's the reason God saved him. But have you ever noticed how gracious God is to this man in all of this time of judgment? It says, come thou. The same invitation that the Lord Jesus gives today to all mankind. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll rest you. And then we're told in verse 16 here, the Lord shut him in. Isn't that lovely? And then chapter 8 opens, and God remembered Noah. (laughs) How lovely. How wonderful. God could have very easily forgotten all about Noah. He could have years later said, oh my, I forgot all about that fellow down there. I put him in an ark and forgot about him. Been too bad, wouldn't it? But God didn't forget. God remembered Noah. God never forgets. He remembers you. The <laughs> only thing that he doesn't remember is your sin if you come to it. And his sins, he remembers them no more. What a beautiful thing this is. Now, Noah and the family enter into the ark. And did you know that this story of Noah, just like the story of creation, has wandered over the face of the earth? And you read it like you read the creation story. I wish that I could give you the Babylonian account. I'm not entering into that. I did of the creation account. But all you have to do is compare them to see the difference that these others are utterly preposterous and ridiculous. And they're all based on this one, by the way. And the very fact that most nations, most peoples have an account of both creation and the flood, doesn't that tell you something, friend? That ought to tell you that there's a basis of truth for that. All of them wouldn't come up with a record if they had been making up the story. And if you want to know which one is accurate, just make a comparison. The Babylonian, of course, here is perfectly ridiculous. And you have sort of a war going on among the gods, one against the other, and that's what brought the flood. That's not the way that the Bible tells it. The judgment upon man for his sin makes sense, by the way. Now we're told here... And for yet seven days, God says, 
I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Now, will you notice the fact that there came to Noah, and I should call attention to this, I was about to bypass it, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. Now, this was the basis of a lawsuit years ago against Dr. Harry Rimmer when he offered $1,000 to anyone that could show a, a contradiction in the Bible, and this was what was used in a court of law. And there were several liberal theologians that testified this was a contradiction. Why would it say two of each kind and now seven of each kind? Well, all you have to do is turn over to see Noah get out of the ark, and he was offering clean beasts as sacrifices. Well, would he have got the clean beast, friends, if he hadn't taken more than the two? It's only the clean beast that he took seven, and now we know why. And those that are not clean were by two, the male and the female. And the fowls of the air by sevens, the male and the female, and that is for those that are clean, to keep seed alive from the face of all the earth. Now, for seven days, the world could have knocked at the door of the ark, and frankly, they could have come in. God would have saved them. All you'd had to do is believe God. Now, we're told, verse 6, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. Noah went in, his sons, his wives, his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. That's verse 7 that I've just read. Then we're told here, verse 9, There went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. No place does it say Noah went out and drove them in. It wasn't necessary. They came to him. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. That's verse 11. The rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And now I drop down and read verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now, we're told that the flood was 40 days upon the earth. Now, the waters, though, prevailed, and I'm dropping down to the last verse, verse 24, chapter 7, and the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. Now, that's how long that the flood lasted, then we're going to find out that it subsided another period of time, and we'll talk about that next time. Now, may I, in a few moments that are left to me, may I say this, what is the scientific historical evidence of the flood? I'm not going to enter into this subject other than to say that there is one of the finest books, and I highly recommend it, called The Genesis Flood by Henry Morris and John C. Whitcomb. Both of these men are thoroughly qualified to write on this subject. Dr. John Whitcomb is a Ph.D., and he's a professor of Old Testament and Grace Theological Seminary. And Dr. Morris is a Ph.D. from the University of Minnesota. And these men have joined together and have written a book on the Genesis Flood. And they show that this flood was universal. And also that it was a great catastrophe, that there's historical evidence for it. And they answer this uniformitarian argument that has been put forth today. And I will not go into these different theories that have been advanced. And there have quite a few been advanced for the flood. But may I say there's abundance of evidence for the flood. And they answer a great deal of this. Now, next time, I'm going to pick up right at this juncture and probably give from their book one or two arguments, and then I'm going to move on from this. I assume that today that there is this historical evidence for the flood, and it's not necessary for us to go into that. And it's been answered in this very graphic and scholarly manner. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, that certainly takes Noah's flood further than the children's section, and it also makes it a tangible part of history. We'll hear more about it next week. If you don't already have a copy of Briefing the Bible, that's Dr. McGee's Notes and Outlines all in one volume, you can download your digital copy today at ttb.org or just call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE to have one sent to you. 
Well, I'm Steve Schwetz. For all of us here at Through the Bible, we're praying that you sense today how deep and wide and long and high is God's great love for you. Jesus came in home, home to him I home. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.